Shadow Blasters for the Sega Genesis by the Ill Fated Sages Creation in association with Sigma Enterprises, circa 1990. Otherwise released in Japan under the title Shiten Myoho. Before we get into yet another mind-blowing review, I'm dedicating this and the next two, as per usual, to Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, High Energy Vintage, Disaster Piece Theater, Boston Open Screen, World Local Productions, Triple Yet Productions, James Rolfe, Kieran Fallon, and Justin Silverman from Cinema Massacre, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Life Lessons with Lewis, Vid Chronicles, Soul Snack, RLS Studios, Nerd Caliber, Brentle Floss, Magfest, Pax East, Too Many Games in Oaks, Pennsylvania, AAC, Another Anime Convention, Jupiter Hall and Neon Bomb in Manchester, New Hampshire, ETU Animated Stories, Sharing My Secret, Anonymous Story Animated, MSA, short for My Story Animated, Women in Film and Video, New England, Bijou Mike, Daisy Alicia from Waltham and Abroad, Kim Chen from Wakefield, Rhode Island, Boston 8-Bit, Geek Beat Radio, Orlando-based artist IQ, voice actress Susie Young, and finally, if he's watching this, to Chad Rude, alias Optimus Chad from New York, this is for you, bro. Oh, one other thing, since the content I'm about to mention, or more to the point have always mentioned, even before now, has already ended by this point, I'm declaring this a special Anime Boston 2022 review. Likewise for the next two, of course. Anyhow, with all this out of the way, why waste any more time, right? Plotline-wise, it's an explosive, rollicking, mystical sci-fi adventure revolving around four magic practitioners, Horatio, Tiffany, Leo, and Marco. Seriously, is this random-ass gag even worth the time? The former two of whom are ninjas, aka Kotaro and Ayame in the original Japanese version, or in her case, a Kunoichi, with the latter two being a fencer, or to be precise, a kendo master, and a former Buddhist monk, aka Senshiro and Kendenbo individually, summoned by the good god Hyperion to crush the ambitions of the evil god Ashura, not to be confused with Kujaku's better half, from the late Makoto Ogino's Peacock King, and his endless hordes of monsters, demons, and dark warriors. Shifting our focus to the main gameplay framework and control aspects, it's a generic yet unique side-scrolling action platformer within which you're in control of the main quartet of magic practitioners slash fighters, each with different attributes and abilities, the latter of whose differences stem from their respective elements, no less. Fire for Horatio, Wind for Tiffany, Spiritual Blades for Leo, and Lightning for Marco. And apart from starting off in one of the six optional yet mandatory areas on Earth, namely the mountains, the urban streets, a remote desolate island during a dark and stormy evening, referred to as Glen, the harbor in a deep forest, and a futuristic mechanical towering hideout of a lab, referred to as Future, you're capable of kicking the adventure off with one of the fighters. Control-wise, the D-pad lets them haul ass and duck wherever, and or make any possible menu selection. Start allows you to swap between the four of them, even in case one of them happens to be on the verge of annihilation, and by default, A summons any martial and or elemental attack. Or you can hold the button down for a short period and unleash a more massive rendition of said attack. A kid's a mystic defender, aka Kujaku 2 B lets your warrior jump, and C summons the special screen nuke incantation, regardless of who you're controlling, which for the record, you're only and strictly limited to one use. Making every minor adversary or bitch is in no time flat. Ditto for the end bosses, which you can swap around in the options menu beforehand, cause the Genesis. Whenever every common adversary is vanquished, various colored Lotus Blossom Power Emblems are provided. Red for speed level ups, blue for jump level ups, white for the elemental attack level ups, crimson for a single life unit, and gray for the entire life meter. In true Ninja Turtles and Mission Impossible fashion, obviously both by Konami and its already defunct Ultra Software subsidiary, apart from being capable of shifting characters mid-stage, they all serve as individual lives. Therefore, expect to die often before doing so, cause it's an instant game over of all them push-up fucking daisies. Infinite continues are available upon that very instance, by the way, but all of the characters' attack power levels and maybe their jump and speed levels are reverted back to dick all upon continuing. 
Regarding the stage-by-stage -stage enemy lineup, considering some appear in more than one area, I might add, you'll be facing off and taking down endless hordes of zombie samurai, flame imps, hopping one-legged spiked plants, floating dragon-like centipedes, bats that fly both in a circular motion within the harbor's interior building and pop up out of nowhere in the forest area, descending psychotic green spiders, concave-shaped beasts, and even various yet almost indescribable mechanic, demonic, and botanical lifeforms alike rolled into one, not just in the first six areas, but also in the next two, the hellish Wicked World, and the Heavenly Sky Temple on high, before the final confrontation between Hyperion and Ashura in outer space. Also, when it comes to the following end bosses, consider yourself their bitches for life should your senses and strategy preparation happen to shit the motherfucking bed, or even worse, take an unnecessary left turn past Albuquerque into the outskirts of Hellview Population 96. Skulltar, a floating demonic skull with isolated hands in the mountains, Brutus, a knife-wielding punk in the urban streets, Callus, a mutant rock golem whose noggin is his weak point on the remote island aka Glen, Belivo, a relentless half-armadillo rodent in the forest, Tarman, a towering shape-shifting blob in the harbor, Gyrena, an isolated bioorganic lifeform housed between two mechanical life support systems within the towering lab, aka Future, which is vulnerable when the barriers are temporarily deactivated, the winged demon Hawkus in the Wicked World, the two-headed sword-wielding beast Wartan in the Heavenly Sky Temple, and finally, Ashura himself. As is the case with every other goddamn action platformer in history, timing, strategy, diversification, and teamwork, mostly due to the fact that this game also features a simultaneous two-player co-op mode, and that you'll be dealing with frequent, habitual character swaps for every situation, are mandatory as shit if you're willing to prevail in their ultimate fated race on Detra, as their journey is a total mixed bag, if slightly teetering on the brink of a fucking cakewalk, hence where our next upcoming subjects comes into it all. As much as I'm making every effort to avoid sounding redundant as all goddamn get out, the controls, while awkward as unexpectedly following someone you barely know in real life, are at the very least straightforward and short of flawed, barring the often recurring damage incidents your characters will sustain depending on how well you telegraph their patterns and offenses, and the gameplay cycle is more than adequate and feasible to adapt to. Challenge-wise, I don't even need to repeat myself mindlessly like an irate-ass suburban chatter Karen, god forbid, on how often you'll be swapping characters around depending on how often you manage to level up their key attributes, specifically their attack power, jumping capabilities, and their speed, despite them still moving about as slow as zombies during an ongoing apocalypse and even two elders having non-stop intercourse for days on end, as well as the tense, triggering moments when they confront each boss. And what's more, there's no way to revive any and or all dead characters except for the continue benefits, about which I also can't stress enough in prompting everyone to refer back to. I mean, fuck! Considering how linear each and every stage is, not counting the final battle in outer space against the shore, there's the traditional in-game elements that'll still drive your ass up the goddamn wall, even on hard mode no less! From the mandatory gap leaps every hero has to take, to the patterns of every minor and major adversary they face. For instance, all the random flying enemies that pop up out of nowhere, thus not only making you their bitch, but also raping your senses non-stop left and right faster than you can say Shungo Kusatsu, aka the Raging Demon or Instant Hell Murder, whichever you prefer. That is, unless you're a master of telegraphing their patterns. The platforms that you stand on in certain stages will fall off or sink in the water upon direct landing, in which case, leap for dear life, haul major ass, and hope for the motherfucking absolute best. And even the goddamn confrontations against each of the earlier noted end bosses will, once the fuck again, jerk you off all over the place and split your appendages worse than Lorena fucking Bobbit. Other than everything else, not only do I suggest for the last time referring back to every commonly pointed out hint regarding both the continues and the character swap benefits to conserve the vitality meters of other characters, but also relying more often on your inner wits, teamwork approaches, especially when participating in this game's aforementioned simultaneous two-player mode, timing, and overall distribution habits when advancing your character's attack, jump, and speed capabilities. <laughs> On the graphical forefront, even for an early yet criminally underrated action platformer hailing from roughly a year or so into the Genesis's lifespan, aka the Mega Drive in Europe and Japan of course, the overall presentation aspects may not be much to go apeshit or cream one's own boxers over, but are still credible enough to stand on their own two feet. In short, it's a fucking mixed bag. The four main mystical heroes stand out from each other in terms of more than just their close-up mugs, but also their in-game personas and the varying incantations they summon depending on who you're experimenting with, notwithstanding how redundant and generic they are in terms of their basic physical commands. 
Hyperion and Azura themselves, both during the pivotal supporting cutscenes and when facing off against each other near the end, forgive any random sophomoric understatements in advance, are quite the visions, especially with the opposing hits of ambition and greed in their respective, provided on-screen lines of dialogue during said cutscenes. Likewise for the diverse choice of all the stage areas that Horatio, Tiffany, Leo, and Margo, yet again A.K. Kotaro, Ayame, Senshiro, and Gendenbo individually, journey through and make every effort to keep their own asses alive, and the unique parochial area of themes they give off in more ways than one, and aren't as repetitive as the enemies that they face, well, with the obvious exception of the bosses, that is. Music and sound-wise, composed by Kim Song Dong of Zoom fame, reprogrammed by Sega themselves, under license from the already defunct Discovery Software International. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. The rather uncanny assortment of themes don't disappoint in the least, regardless, and I do mean regardless, goddammit, of what the fuck anyone says. Starting from not only the title, but also the two-part intro themes featuring Hyperion's story, and even the bios of his four summoned heroes, to the six different areas, despite a third of them recycling the same three goddamn tracks, plus the two climactic areas, leading up to the often referenced last fight between Hyperion and Ashura, well, three if you count the latter, and especially the stage select and character select anthem, the game over theme, the ending, you name it. All of which are far from complete earring fests. The sound effects, however, are where you're better off looking the other way due to how often they're heard, considering the importance of maintaining an intense, nostalgically interactive vibe in every stage, and how much they drown out the aforementioned soundtrack. But then again, who am I to incessantly bitch about a minor aspect, right? Regarding the replay value, there's very little to comment on at this point, but it should be painfully fucking obvious what's at stake here regarding Shadow Blasters. Apart from being short as fucking length, from at least half an hour to three quarters of an hour to be precise, and the lack of alternate paths and or secret areas, which flips everyone shit faster than an instant serving of blueberry and chocolate chip flapjacks in the morning, the difficulty setting differences, which affect the enemy movement and attack patterns, and even their hitbox sizes, and yes, the end bosses count as well, and even the customized order of stages you're allowed to start off in, akin to Mega Man and Shatterhand, which, not surprisingly, apply a shitload of strategy to each experimental playthrough, and then some, are all the more recent to experience what this 16-bit platformer is made of. Henceforth, you'd be off your goddamn rocker to leave this game out in the blistering cold before random-ass Yeti comes crashing by. Therefore, what's my end-all be-all final verdict? Just as I pointed out with Mystic Defender months ago, this is yet another overlooked action platformer not to be missed, ever, what with the supernatural and everyday life collision vibes it gives off, and then some. So everything I've discussed so far up until this point should once again be all the more reason to seek it out by any common means necessary. In addition, this game's rightful developer, the already defunct Cyclone System, a small outfit headed by ex-employees of yet another ill-fated firm, ICOM, later renamed Yumakobo, also responsible for Asmic Ace and Soulful's Worm, Journey to the Center of the Earth for the NES, and even Taito's Saint Sword and Kadash, and the aforementioned Zoom on Genesis, working alongside Sigma Enterprises, never had as much clout to claim their own IPs despite their tendency to toil in the shadows until reaching that very point, much unlike Atlas and Arc System Works, well, to name a few of their competitors at the time, and thus, they went tits up. Yeah, ain't that a bitch, right? Either way, a loose copy should run you roughly 22 bucks, while those ranging from complete in box to brand new should run you 65 to 163 big ones, so there should be no excuse whatsoever to snatch and secure for yourself the unforgettable, epic odyssey of the Shadow Blasters, aka the Fordon and Kings. Until then, considering the two-month absence I've been faced with due to scheduling conflicts, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God once again triumphantly signing off.